Okay. All right, I'm going to try to be a little bit louder than that. Um, welcome to the workshop. Uh, we are delighted to have all of you here. Um, we uh, all right, thanks everyone for uh, showing up uh, what is what is maybe a little bit early on the West Coast. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about adaptive data analysis um, in my talk, actually not about differential privacy, Adam will, will do some of that. Um, and probably for you know a little bit less than half the audience, you'll know a lot about what I'm going to say, but hopefully this is a friendly introduction to the kinds of problems that we've been studying in the computer science community for the last few years uh, to the other half of the audience. Um, so, so maybe like a, a good sort of example to begin with is to think about the, the ImageNet competition, um, which was particularly interesting in its, in its 2015 iteration. Um, so this is a, a sort of classification competition where you've got a bunch of um, images, a lot of them, 1.5 million in the training set, and you want to categorize them into um, a bunch of sort of pretty finely defined categories. And the way the competition was run is that these uh, training images were made available to everyone, uh, but uh, competitors were going to be scored on, on a validation set of about 100,000 images. And there was, you could check the performance of your model on this validation set, but they were sort of you know, a little bit concerned that this wasn't a safe thing to do. So they, they added a limitation that you could only check your uh, performance twice per week. Um, so, so in the 2015 iteration, you know, there was this exciting announcement in, in March by Baidu. Uh, they announced that they'd achieved uh, record accuracy, uh, you know, beating those, those uh, schmucks at Google. Uh, they posted a paper about this. Uh, the, the team lead said that you know, they were now leading the race in computer intelligence. They had great power in their hands, much greater than their competitors. Um, this was the, the great power they had. Um, but it quickly sort of came out that they had cheated. So, so how had they cheated? It turned out that they circumvented this rule that you could only test two models uh, per week. Instead, they'd registered 30 fake accounts that they could check a lot of models per week. And so uh, this was discovered. They were banned from the competition for a year. The, the paper was withdrawn. The guy who said this was fired. Uh, but um, sort of what the, the basic question that I want to talk about in this hour is, you know, OK, why was this cheating? Like, why did being able to validate your model over and over help? And what is the sort of thing that we might imagine doing as algorithm designers to prevent that? OK, okay. so um, you know, the, the, the most basic problem with validating you know, a lot of different hypotheses is what's, what's known as the multiple comparisons problem uh, and is you know, uh, the problem of uniform convergence in, in machine learning. Let me introduce it just in the, um, you know, in the framework of validating you know, like the performance of machine learning models, although of course it's more general. So suppose we've got some classifier that maps you know, images to labels. We've got some data set. Let's assume that it consists of n entries that are drawn IID from some fixed but unknown distribution. And the thing we want to know is the sort of performance of our classifier. So maybe we've got some loss function that you know, just measures whether we've gotten the correct label or not. You have loss 1 if you get the incorrect label. Although again, we could talk about other loss functions. And the thing that you're interested in is the true loss of this classifier on the distribution, by which I mean you know, the expected value of the loss function when I draw a new example from the distribution and then try to classify it, like the probability that I get the error wrong. Now, this quantity is defined with respect to the distribution, which I don't have direct access to. And so the thing that we can actually estimate is not the true loss, but rather the empirical loss. Right? So I can, I can look at my data set, and I can look at, on average, like what is the performance of my classifier on my data set. OK, so, so I can estimate this, but I want to know this. Now, uh, fortunately, you know, it's, it's not too hard to, to relate these things. Um, you know, Huffington's inequality allows us to basically put confidence intervals around our empirical estimates. So you know, I can say that you know, even with not too much data, I've got um, 
you know, pretty good estimates for what the true loss is. In fact, with probability 1 minus delta, the difference between my empirical estimate of the loss and the true loss uh, is something that's sort of going to 0 at, on, on the order of sort of 1 over the square root of the number of data points I've got. So that's pretty good. Okay, so that's not the multiple comparisons problem. This is sort of estimating a single, you know, statistic. Um, the multiple comparisons problem is what happens when I've got more than one statistic. Suppose I've got k different classifiers. So I, you know, if I tried to just use exactly the same bound from the last slide to, to bound not just my you know, empirical loss for one of these classifiers, but my sort of loss for the least accurate of these classifiers. And the reason I might want to do that is if, for example, uh, I'm going to look at all of my classifiers and report only the one that is most accurate, then I might sort of need to have confidence intervals around the accuracy of all of them simultaneously. Um, you know, just because there's more than one of them, uh, the, the bound from the previous slide won't be valid anymore. So to be conservative, what we can do is we can just ask for uh, uniform convergence. We can ask for confidence intervals that simultaneously, if with probability 1 minus delta, simultaneously hold for every model in this class. OK, so that we can just apply the Hufting um, inequality together with a union bound, or what you might call a Bonferroni correction if you're a statistician. Um, and you know, basically, our, our sort of um, confidence parameter that was previously delta will now just set it to be delta over k. Um, and, and now we have sort of simultaneous uh, confidence intervals that hold for every classifier, every model in our class, uh, where you know, all I've paid is in the logarithm. I've got sort of a log k where before I had a, you know, a constant up here. Um, so this is actually still pretty good. Like when n is large, right, because our, 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 you know, um, our error bound goes to 0 at a, root, at a rate of 1 over square root of n, but is sort of growing with k only logarithmically in k, um, this is a very mild correction, right? In fact, when you look at what Baidu did, they only submitted roughly 200 um, classifiers, so k wasn't that big. The size of the validation set was pretty big, n was 100,000. So actually, you know, it looks like you can apply sort of simultaneous 95% confidence intervals around um, all of the models they submitted that have sort of width that is actually small enough to confirm their improvement over Google's model. Okay. But, but there's, a, there's a problem here. Like, um, you know, in this, in this sort of exercise, we assumed that all of these classifiers were fixed up front, okay, and we took a union bound over them. But, you know, um, if you're sequentially submitting these models to be verified, that's not the case. You have what we're going to call adaptivity in that you can choose the next model to submit as a function of the uh, answers you got from your previous checks. Uh, and so you know, this, uh, this sort of simultaneous confidence interval bound that we can just get just by applying a Hufting inequality and a union bound, it, it no longer works. It's not correct. So let's think about what can go wrong. So here's sort of a, a simple thing we might do. Uh, I want to think about binary data just for this example. Um, so you know, think about our data as having D Boolean features. Every feature can be true or false. Our label is also binary. And we're just going to think about um, the following you know, learning procedure that's just going to operate through the kind of uh, model validation interface that Baidu had available to them. OK, so we're going to do something very reasonable. For every feature, we're just going to figure out what is the um, error of the simple classifier that just predicts that the label is equal to the ith feature. So we're just checking the correlation between the ith feature and the label. And if our empirical loss is less than 50%, so if it looks like um, our feature is sort of weakly correlated with the label. We'll remember that. We'll set this variable to 1. Otherwise, if it looks like our, our feature is weakly anti-correlated with the label, we'll remember that as well. OK, we'll set this feature equal to negative 1. And our final classifier will just be sort of this linear threshold function, which is just a majority vote. We're going to look at a new example. We'll see if it has more variables that, are, that we've decided are correlated with the label than it has that are anti-correlated. If so, we'll decide the label's 1. Otherwise, we'll decide the label's minus 1. OK. This thing doesn't ask that many questions, by the way. It validates d plus 1 models in total, one for every feature, and then the final one. Okay. So I haven't told you 
what the data distribution is. But before I do that, let me just show you. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So what was k before is now d? D plus 1, yeah. Um, OK, so, so let's like see what happens when we run this, uh, you know, keeping in mind that I haven't yet told you what the data distribution looks like. So this is just a plot of the sort of reported final accuracy of the last classifier we submitted, um, where I'm just varying on the illegible x-axis. The number of features in my data goes from 1 to 50,000. Uh, and the confidence intervals I'm plotting here are just the sort of uh, Bonferroni corrected confidence intervals that you would get by naively applying, you know, like a union bound to the d plus 1 models you've submitted. OK, so what you can see is that, you know, especially as the number of features grows, um, we're getting a more and more accurate classifier. And our confidence intervals are telling us that this is a real phenomenon, right? Like we're, we're like definitely doing better than 50% error. Um, OK, but you know, uh, what I didn't tell you is that in this plot, actually, the data and the labels are entirely uncorrelated with one another. They're all uniformly distributed with no relationship to one another. So all classifiers have error you know, exactly 50%. And the Bonferroni correction is clearly sort of catastrophically failing here. Like we are, not only are we sort of appearing to get accuracy that's much higher than 50%, the, the confidence intervals are misleading us into thinking that it's statistically significant. OK, so, so I want to think about first like why that's happening, what the sort of Bonferroni correction is failing to take into account, and then you know, what we could do to, to fix it. OK, so um, okay, what I'm drawing here is what, in a nice paper of, of Gelman and Loken, they called the garden of the forking paths. But um, you know, okay, what is that garden? You, know, you can draw sort of, in our case, since our procedure was very simply specified, you know, like a decision tree of what our learning procedure would have done in every eventuality. OK, so it's checking the first feature. It's seeing whether it's correlated with the label or not. And it's remembering that. So think about that as the left or the right branch. Then it's checking the second feature. It's deciding whether it was correlated with the label or not. It's remembering that. That's checking the left or the right branch at the second level. OK. And by the time it's gotten down to the, the, the leaves, it's asked a question like this for each of the D features, it decides on some classifier. OK. Uh, and now there's like two to the D classifiers that it could have come up with, one for each choice of whether the label was correlated or not. OK. Now a particular run of this algorithm just takes some particular path down this tree. It, it asks you know, D plus 1 questions in total. But of course, you know, it could have taken any other path. And in this case, they were all equally likely. OK. So like the, the problem, the thing that like misled us when we were trying to simply apply this Bonferroni correction is we, we applied it to the d plus 1 questions we actually asked, the particular path we took down the tree. But like there were a, a vastly larger number of models that we could have checked. There were 2 to the d. And if we wanted to sort of be safe, what we would have had to do was apply the Bonferroni correction to all of those, to all of the 2 to the d models that we might have asked. OK. so. so uh, this is what I think Gelman and Loken call the sort of implicit uh, multiple comparisons problem. You have to be careful to correct for not just the questions you actually asked, but all of the questions you might have asked had the answers come out differently. OK. Um, and like in this case, right, so, so conservatively, you have to correct for all of those. In this case, it seems like you really do have to in the sense that um, you know, like you'd have to plug in a number of models into the sort of Bonferroni correction that was equal to 2 to the d, basically, before these confidence intervals became wide enough to correctly account for the true 50% error that all of these models have. OK. So um, OK, you could imagine doing that, but it's got some issues. Um, so first, the corrections are just like giant. Like in this case, you know, like you'd have to take a union bound over two to the d models. Your confidence intervals would become like trivial. In this case, for good reason because you're not really learning anything. Uh, so the problem is adaptivity. You know, first like blows blows up the implicit multiple comparisons problem by an exponential factor. The other thing is, you know, like. It, at least for this procedure, we could have implicitly done it. Like if we, if we know a very precise and simple description of the analysis procedure that we're doing, you know, then we have you know, like a map of the garden. We can union bound over all of the leaves. 
But in general, that's an unusual case, right? Like whenever the decision procedure itself is not is complicated or not precisely specified, for example, if there's a human being in the loop making decisions, then we're not, we're not even going to be able to draw this tree, right? We're not going to have a map of, of Gelman and Loken's garden of the forking paths. And we'd like to, so these are right, two different issues. The first is even if we have the map, you know, just correcting for everything, every model we might have arrived at is just sort of expensive. But the other issue is that generally we won't have this map of the garden. Okay, so, so what do we do? So one solution that's, that's started gaining currency in, in parts of the social sciences is pre-registration. And this sort of corresponds to just, if you like, gating off the garden, like committing ahead of time to not making choices as a function of the data. Instead, like before you even look at the data, you publicly commit to the analysis procedures you're going to do. And, and when you publish a paper, you, you show this public commitment that you made you know, on a, on a uh, you know, website that specializes in making these kinds of commitments. What did you say? On a blockchain. On a blockchain. Sure, it's it's uh, it's in the blockchain. Um, so this sort of it's just forcing the analyst. It's gating off the garden. It's forcing the analyst to just walk in a straight line. And if done correctly, it's safe. But it's it's sort of overly conservative because it doesn't allow us to do data exploration. And if you think about it, it's sort of incompatible with data reuse. You know, if you publish a pre-registered study and then I read your paper and then I want to like get your data set and do something with it, well, I've read your paper now. So even if I'm not trying to, everything I, I do from that point forward is somehow a function of the data because your paper was. Okay. So we want to think about um, what we can do to make it safe to, to walk in the garden of forking paths. Okay, so, so let me now uh, write down a, a formalization of this problem so that we can think about it rigorously. Um, this is a particular formalization, but not the only one. Um, I'll, maybe I'll try to mention things that are important and things that are not. But let's just sort of go through the formalization that I'm going to specify. Um, but, but don't think of all of these as essential assumptions. Just think about this as a particular framework I'm setting up so that we can see what's possible. Okay, so, so one of the things we'll have in this world is what I'll call a data universe. Okay, these are just, this is just the space from which our um, individual data set entries live in. So for example, if uh, my data set entries consist of D Boolean attributes, then uh, you know, maybe our data universe is the set of vectors that can be written by as sort of D, uh, no, D Boolean uh, variables. Um, it's not necessarily essential that this is finite, although that'll be useful for some things, but not for everything. There'll be a distribution over this data universe. Okay, this is ultimately the object that we wish to learn about. Okay. Uh, but we won't have direct access to this distribution. Instead, we have a data set that just consists of n elements sampled IID from this distribution. Okay, now uh, we're going to talk about, and this is the part that's not strictly necessary, but it'll make things easier. We're going to talk about answering what I'll call statistical queries. This is a name from the machine learning literature, but uh, you know, if you haven't heard that name before, don't worry. It's a very simple object. A statistical query is just some predicate defined over the data universe. So for example, it might be uh, like the loss function of your classifier. Does it misclassify an example or not? And the answer to a statistical query, the thing we want to estimate, is just the expected value of this predicate when I draw a new example from the distribution. So if this is like the 0, 1 loss function for your classifier, this is the true classification error rate of your, of your model. Okay. And the thing that we are going to want to try to design is a statistical query oracle, which is just an algorithm that's going to be parameterized by our data set. And we'll take as input a sequence of queries that we want to ask, and we'll spit out numbers, which are purportedly the answers to those queries. Okay. And we want to think about adaptively chosen queries. So um, here in this example, here's the algorithm we get to design. The algorithm is parameterized by some data set, which is drawn IID from this distribution. But the algorithm doesn't have any other direct access to the distribution. Its access is only through the data set. Okay. And the queries are going to be adaptive. So our, our data analyst will ask some query, and the, uh, the statistical estimator we, we design will give some answer. Okay. 
the data analyst now gets to think about that answer and ask another query. And he gets some other answer. Okay, and he'll continue in this way asking k questions. And the point is, this is happening, happening sequentially, so you know, like the, the, the choice of what question he asks at step t can be a function of all of the answers he's received at previous steps. Okay. And so now we, we want to design statistical estimators that have nice properties. Well, what do we want as our nice property? We want that our estimator should be able to like, give correct answers uh, with sort of valid confidence intervals, um, no matter what sequence of adaptively chosen queries we've asked. So we don't want to assume anything about the actual procedure. You know, the, 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 we don't want to assume about anything about what the data analyst is doing. We want to sort of state properties that we can, we can prove only knowing something about the statistical estimator. Okay, so we'll say, we'll say that a statistical estimator is epsilon delta accurate if for any set of k queries asked by an arbitrary data analyst, so it'll be a universal quantifier over the data analyst, and no matter what distribution the data withdrawn from, uh, with high probability, with probability one minus delta, we want that in the worst case over all of the questions that were asked, the answers that our statistical estimator produced had error only epsilon when compared to the real answers on the distribution. Okay, so these are just simultaneous confidence intervals around all k questions asked, but we want that our estimator should have guarantees that are sort of universally quantified over all possible data analysts and all possible distributions. Okay, so our main quantity of interest is going to be, you know, like when we, when we think about what kinds of estimators we can design, it's you know, how quickly must the width of our confidence intervals, epsilon, scale up with the number of questions that are asked, and how quickly do they scale down with the size of our data set? Okay, so just for point of comparison, in the non-adaptive case, when we can just apply a Huffding bound and a union bound, um, our confidence interval, our simultaneous confidence intervals have width that scale up only with the logarithm of the number of questions asked, okay? And in our sort of example overfitting attack, um, we saw that the confidence inter where the algorithm was just responding with the, imp the exact empirical uh, estimate of all of the questions asked, we saw that if we wanted to endow that with valid confidence intervals, they would have to scale up with the square root of the number of questions asked, so something that was exponentially worse. And the question is, you know, like in the adaptive case, do we have to settle for something like this, or can we? You know, if we're clever, design statistical estimators that do better. Okay, so we want to like move this closer to this. Okay, so so let's start with a with an easy theorem. I've I've uh, dumped the harder theorem on Adam. So um, here's an easy theorem, and it's maybe a theorem of the sort. You know, if if pigs could fly, then then cows could dance, because it's going to have a condition that is like not obvious a priori that you can meet in an interesting way. Okay, but the theorem itself is easy to prove. So let's say that we've got a statistical estimator that has the property, or that has two properties. Okay, first, no matter what sequence of adaptively chosen queries are actually asked to it, it should be empirically accurate. Okay, by which I mean, if I look at the worst case overall of the queries um, of the sort of error of the answer given to that query, not measured with respect to the true distribution, which we don't know, but just measured with respect to the empirical estimate. Okay, so the difference between the answer our estimator gives and the empirical estimate of our uh, question on the true data set, that shouldn't be too big. That should be bounded by some, some tau. Okay, fine, so, so you know, we can easily make this zero, for example, just by answering with empirical estimates exactly. Okay, but, so if it has this property, but then it also has this second property, which I'll call compressibility, okay, that the transcript, no matter what questions are asked, the transcript of answers given by the estimator can always be described concisely. There's some way to compress its answers to, to be represented with only t bits. Okay. Then I claim you've got you know, an interesting statistical estimator, and you can say that it's epsilon delta accurate, so, so with high probability answers all of its questions correctly up to error epsilon. Um, where the epsilon parameter is now, okay, tau, I mean, you, you can't really beat that, plus this quantity that now 
scales only logarithmically with the number of questions asked. Okay, this was like what we had in the non-adaptive case. But also with the square root of now not the number of questions, but the number of bits to which your estimator was compressible to. Okay, so this is you know, a big improvement over square root of k over n if you can somehow come up with an estimator for which t is much smaller than k. Okay, and I, this is, I, you know, I wrote if pigs could fly because it shouldn't be like a priori obvious that you, know, you should be able to have non-trivial estimators that set t to be substantially smaller than k, right? Because the thing we have to compress is the, the, the numeric answers to like k arbitrary questions that were asked about the data set. Okay, but this is a theorem and it's got a very easy proof, so I'll, I'll do it for you now. And this uh, can be compressed by someone who's just watching the transcript or, or what? Um, this compressor, what does it have access to? Yeah, the, I guess the compressor... Um, good question. It'll, it'll, it's not a theorem, I understand, but, but still. Yeah, so it, it'll become... Uh, the coins of the analyst. Yeah, so, so if you, it, maybe it'll become clear in the discussion that follows, but it, it should be compressible um, by the analyst if you know his random coins uh, after you know um, the answers that were given to you. So, so, so the, the analyst knowing his random coins and the sequence of answers given by the algorithm should be able to perform the compression. Just the analyst that can compress. Yes. <coughs> Good question. Right? Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's actually a, a bit of a subtle point in some of these analyses. Yeah, that's, a, that's yeah, good question. Um, okay, so, so let's prove the theorem, and just so we don't have to worry about the random coins of the analyst, let's think about a deterministic analyst. But it does, that's not an important distinction. So fix any data analyst. Okay, which could be a human being. Um, it's just some function mapping the answers he's gotten to his questions to the next question he's going to ask. Okay, so it maps every um, sequence of query answers to a sequence of queries that are asked. Um, right, so, so the point is just for every, every sequence of k queries asked corresponds to some particular transcript of answers that was generated by the statistical estimator A. Okay. So like one immediate fact about compressibility, if we can always compress these transcripts to t bits, uh, there's only two to the t of them. So that means that actually, you know, even though we assume nothing about this data analyst, there's, he can't ask that many questions, right? Like for every transcript of answers, of which there's only two to the t of them, he asks k questions. So there's only k times two to the t questions that he can ever ask. So let's just apply, you know, once we, once we know a finite number of questions that can be asked, even though we don't know the identity of those questions because we don't know who the data analyst is, um, we can still apply a bond for any corrections. We can still apply a, just a Hufting bound and a union bound where we're now going to union bound not over, you know, like two to the k things, but over k times two to the t things. Okay, so we get that our generalization error in the worst case over these k times two to the t many queries well, it's at most this, something that looks like the square root of t plus log k over n. So this is uh, conditioning on the randomness in the analyst? Let's think about deterministic analysts for now, but since it will hold for all deterministic analysts, we can integrate over, we can integrate over the randomness, exactly. Um, OK, so this is just bounding the difference between our sort of sample error and our distributional error just with a Hufting bound and a, and a union bound. Well, we also assumed that our empirical accuracy was good. The distance between our empirical error and the answer actually provided by the mechanism was small by assumption. And so the theorem, which is just, you know, says our uh, ultimate error is the sum of these two terms that just follows from the triangle inequality. Okay, so this is not a complicated theorem. There's a sort of straightforward way you can uh, come up with uh, generalization guarantees for adaptively answered queries with the big caveat that in order for this theorem to apply, you have to come up with some like, pretty good way to compress uh, the answers to, to produced by these transcripts. <coughs> okay. So, so you know, for most of the rest of the talk, I'm going to think about ways in which we might design algorithms that compress answer, that, that generate compressible transcripts. But let me first reflect on the strengths of this style of theorem and the more complicated theorem that, that uh, Adam's going to talk about. 
so first, like the hypotheses of this theorem are entirely about the statistical estimator that we get to design. Okay, they're you know agnostic to the details of the data analyst, which we get to universally quantify over. So you know like. We don't need a map of the garden. We don't need to be able to like draw out this garden of the forking paths. Uh, we can apply the Bonferroni correction to what we can reason is only a bounded number of queries, even though we don't know what they are. Which means that like we don't have to like the data analyst doesn't have to be like an algorithm that we have to think about. It could be a human being. Um, also, since like we're universally quantifying over data analysts, you know. Other than sort of requiring that the data analyst interact with the data only through our interface, we don't have to constrain him at all. Okay, so he is promised, you know, like an interface for which he can ask questions, and we're promising that the answers that he gets are always pretty accurate. So long as he can interact uh, in that method, um, like we don't have to constrain what he's doing. So in comparison to pre-registration, he's got sort of, you know, full full reign to do whatever he likes. Okay, and, and so the the main question that comes out once you've seen this theorem is, are there non-trivial estimators that actually like satisfy the conditions of the theorem? OK. The answer is yes. Let me, let me sort of, um, I'm going to go through three of them now um, that, will, that will each have sort of different kinds of guarantees. The first will be a little bit heuristic. The second will have worst case guarantees, but only for a particular kind of you know, use case. And then the third will be able to answer arbitrary statistical queries. But, but first, um, let, let's maybe think about like a general framework that we can think about for designing compressible estimators. Okay, so suppose for a moment that whenever we get a question, whenever the statistical estimator gets a question, a statistical query, it comes also with a guess, GI, for what the answer to that question is going to be. Okay, who, who knows where these guesses are coming from, but suppose questions are paired with guesses. Well, in that case, when we get a query of this sort, there's two ways we can answer. Right? Remember, we have to be tau accurate. Our error is allowed to be only at most tau with respect to the empirical answer. So it could be that the guess is, also, is already empirically accurate. The difference between the guess and the like, sample error is already less than tau, in which case we don't really have to answer with a number. We can just say, yep, right? because uh, the data analyst, once he learns, yep, knows that he actually already has a number that uh, tells him up to error tau what the answer is. OK. Um, of course, you know, like the guesses probably won't always be right. So when they're wrong, when the error is larger than tau, we say nope. Uh, and then we actually provide a, a number. We tell him an empirical uh, answer that has error you know, tau. OK. So suppose we had the, the additional guarantee that not only do these questions come with guesses, but that the guesses are often correct, meaning that uh, only W of these guesses are wrong. And there's sort of an obvious way to compress things. Okay, so, so one way to encode this transcript is to, um, you know, if, if I know that it's only, the guesses were only wrong a small number of times, I'm only going to tell you about those days in which the guesses were wrong, and you can then figure out that on all of the other days, the answer was yep. Okay. So, so, so one simple you know, way to like encode this transcript it, oops, is to just um, write down a bunch of tuples. Okay? Each tuple will contain the index of a question whose guess was wrong. And then it'll also contain, since we have to provide an empirical answer for those questions, uh, a numerical answer to that question. But since we only need to have empirical accuracy tau, I only need to write down the numerical answer to like log 1 over tau, bits of precision. OK, so you know, um, we can compress such transcripts to roughly you know, w plus uh, log k plus log 1 over tau bits of precision because, well, we're writing down w tuples. There's only w entries in this list if the guesses we're wrong only w times. Uh, and then in every tuple, we had to write down an index of a query. That's a number between 1 and k. So that takes log k bits. And we had to write down also a numeric valued answer, but only to log 1 over tau bits of precision. OK. So immediately, you get, just by sort of plugging this in, that if somehow we could, um, if somehow 
our questions were paired with guesses, and we knew that only W of them were ever going to be wrong, then we would get um, you know, confidence interval widths that sort of scale like this. They scale with what looks like the confidence interval widths just when we take a sort of union bound, a bond for any correction over k non-adaptively chosen queries, uh, then, but, but then within the square root a W here. Okay, so our error scales not with the number of questions that were asked, but with the number of questions whose answers were wrong. Okay, so, so the point is to come up with compressible estimators, which, you know, who knows if we can do, it suffices to come up with a way of coming up with good guesses for the questions we ask. Okay, also not clear if we can do that. Yeah? Sorry, that's obvious, but why did what become n? Um, oh, uh, you know, maybe you could replace it with a square root log or something. When balancing the two terms, you know, like tau is going to be some, um, you know, like one over poly n term, like when you opt, like, like ultimately you're going to optimize for tau. And just clarifying the notion of compressibility one more time. It's basically some sort of Kolmogorov worst case encoding kind of. That's right. Any encoding that the data analyst could do. That's right. Um, okay. So, so that reduces our problem to you know coming up with a, a way to augment queries with um, good guesses for their answers. Okay. And it should be. You should be able to come up with these guesses with only information that the data analyst has. But of course, it's not actually necessary that the data analyst comes up with the guesses himself. You know, the, this, all, this all works if it's the statistical estimator coming up with the guesses, so long as the statistical estimator is doing so only from information that's available to the data analyst. Okay. So I want to go through three ways of coming up with guesses. Okay, the first. Um, is going to have sort of only sort of a heuristic guarantee for how many guesses are wrong, and we'll go through a couple of other ways. Okay, but here's a way that like might work well in practice. This is called the reusable holdout from uh, a paper that we had with Cynthia and Vitali and Moritz and Tony Patassi and Omer Reingold a few years ago. Um, Okay, so, so it's actually a very simple idea. We're just going to take our data set S and we're going to split it in half, say, okay, into a dirty set and a clean set. Okay? And we're going to give the clean set to our sort of statistical estimator. We're going to try to get transcripts that are compressible with respect to the clean set. So we'll get sort of statistical validity guarantees with respect to the clean set. And we're just going to use the dirty set to come up with our guesses. Okay, so uh, for every query that's asked, the guess for the answer to that query is just the empirical answer of that query on the dirty set. And then the thing that gets submitted to the statistical estimator, which is parameterized by the clean set, is just the query asked together with our guess, just the empirical answer to that query on the dirty set. And to, to make sure that you know no more than W guesses are wrong, since we're not going to have really formal guarantees about how often this process is going to come up with a wrong guess. We're just going to like cut things off. We're going to halt if sufficiently many uh, guesses are wrong. If more than W guesses are wrong, to the sort of error tolerance that they will be allowed to be wrong with that our, our compressibility theorem has. Okay. So this is an algorithm that takes sort of a parameter W. So, so wait, who's doing this? Uh, the, the analyst is doing it. So I've described it as if the analyst is doing it, but of course that's not necessary. It could be that the statistical estimator has, you know, has the whole data set, splits it into these two things, and like so. Whenever I, whenever I'm talking about the analyst computing a guess, think about that as the statistical estimator really coming up with the guess. I've written it as if the analyst does it just to sort of emphasize that it, you know, it's very important that the guesses use only information that's available to the analyst. But the, guess, the guessing process can be like automated by the API that we design. Um, OK. So, so we just halt if, if more than W guesses were wrong. OK. So, so the guarantees that this, this have, that this process has um, are, are a little bit heuristic. I mean, there's a theorem. But what the theorem says is that 
so long as this procedure continues to be able to answer questions, you have the guarantee that none of the answers to your questions are going to err by more than you know, the square root of w log k over n. So they will be sort of much more accurate than um, sort of the answers you could get from like a naive empirical sample estimator, uh, so long as you chose w to be something pretty small. But like the guarantee that we don't have is that this thing will answer all of your questions, right? Because this thing's just going to have like a sharp cutoff. When you, when you answer w questions wrong, it's going to stop. OK, so, so when it stops, it's sort of a heuristic guarantee. Um, the point is that, uh, oh, so first one observation, you know, if you remember from the very beginning, this sort of simple like majority attack, well, this procedure will entirely, you know, uh, break that attack in the sense that in that attack, there was really only one adaptive step. We asked for the correlation of each feature with the label, which by just a standard, you know, like von Ferroni correction, will tend to agree um, on the, the dirty set and the clean set because there was no adaptivity there. And we really sort of overfit in the last query when we then, from this information, constructed a model. So there, there was sort of, you know, we were, like the possibility for one overfitting query, and this thing will, will stop that so long as w is bigger than 1. OK, so it fixes that attack. Yeah? I got a little bit confused, because in this procedure that you're running, how does the algorithm answer yes without actually acquiring a bit? Because you're saying the algorithm doesn't answer anything, but that's effectively so the if you're running it in this sort of sequential way. Right, so um, you just need that like after the fact, basically it's compressible because you just need to count the number of transcripts that could be generated. So the point is if, if most of the answers are yep, I, don't, you know, I can more concisely describe the transcript to you than telling you I said yep on day one. It doesn't matter how you get to the transcript. That's right. I just, like ultimately. Post facto, the transcript is small, you're okay. That's right. Ultimately all I need is that there can't be that many different transcripts. Um, OK. And, and then sort of more generally, the kind of thing this promises is that, you know, this will allow you to answer questions for a long time, since we only depend logarithmically on k, with accuracy guarantees, so long as you're doing something sensible, basically. So long as you haven't gotten lost in this garden of the forking paths. You have access to it, and it's going to catch and correct you know, up to w instances of overfitting and, and stop after w. But if you're doing something that is actually not overfitting, then you can keep using this. So now let me talk about the ladder mechanism, which is something that Avram Blum and Moritz developed a couple of years ago. This is going to be a mechanism that um, has formal guarantees, so there's no heuristic aspect of that. But it will be limited to sort of answering a, you know, it's, a, it's limited to maintaining a leaderboard in a machine learning competition. So it's not a general purpose mechanism. Okay. So the idea here is to sort of do something like, you know, what the ImageNet folks might have liked to, to provide the functionality they wanted, but prevent the kind of cheating that Baidu did. People are going to submit machine learning models to this leaderboard. And what we want to be able to sort of consistently answer with is the accuracy of the best model that's been submitted so far. OK, so here's how you can design a compressible version of that in this guessing framework. You know, we're going to keep track of what's the best error so far. Uh, initially, you know, one, 100 percent. Okay, and now, you know, sequentially, people will submit classifiers. Okay, they'll say, "Here's my machine learning model. Uh, you know, is it the best model so far? And if so, what's it? So what's its error?" Okay, so that corresponds to a query that, if you notice, is not a statistical query, but that's okay. Right. So, so if I've just submitted the model f then the query I'm really interested in asking is, what is the sort of loss of the best model that's been submitted so far? Maybe it's the model submitted today, but maybe it's something submitted previously. And the guess that we're going to come up with is just that the current model hasn't substantially improved. Okay? The, the, the current model is within tau of the error of the, of the sort of best model yesterday. So our guess is always going to be whatever the best error is so far. Okay. 
And then we'll um, you know, compute the answer by just submitting to our compressible estimator the query and the guess. Okay. And you know, if the model we just submitted had error that did not improve by tau over the best previous thing, we'll just say, yep, your guess was right. The best thing is within tau of whatever it was yesterday. Uh, but if the guess was wrong by more than tau, uh, our estimator you know, provides a numerical answer saying what the current best error is and we'll update our guess. The best error now when we guess tomorrow will be whatever the error of today's model was. Okay. Okay. So now we can really, so first, you know, like, okay, this is maintaining a leaderboard. It's not answering arbitrary statistical queries, but it will have a guarantee that, like, we can really, there's nothing heuristic about this. We can really prove um, that the guess will be wrong only a, you know, bounded number of times because the error of a classifier is like a number between zero and one. And every time a guess was wrong, it meant that the current model improved by tau over the last one. So we've sort of lowered that error by tau. And you can't lower a number between zero and one by tau more than one over tau many times. So the number of uh, errors, uh, the, the, sort of, the number of times the guess was wrong by more than tau is bounded by one over tau. Okay, and so we can just apply the sort of compressibility theorem. The total error is just tau plus the square root of 1 over tau log k over n. Now tau is something we as the designer get to pick, so we just pick tau to optimize this error, and we get a, a pretty good bound, something that, is, that goes to zero at a rate of log k over n to the one third. Okay, so it's answering a limited class of queries, these leaderboard queries. But now our error is sort of looking like what you would get in the non-adaptive case. Okay, the, the exponent's not quite right. It's not one half, it's one third now. But the error is growing only, you know, like logarithmically in the number of questions asked, not polynomially. How big would n need to be for me to know that I'm winning image net? Maybe Moritz knows the answer to that. I mean, um, I can't do it in my head. Like, the same, you want a sample size calculation based yeah, yeah. on this bound? I mean, it would be bad. Okay. But like, if you apply it heuristically, it you know, gets pretty reasonable bounds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I put twiddles so I don't have to answer questions like that. Uh, is that how it works? Yeah. <laughs> I, I had a different interpretation of the twiddle, but I, now yeah. I know. It's exactly. I said, don't ask. Um, okay. And now let me walk through um, a method that will allow you to answer arbitrary sequences of statistical queries. Okay. So uh, um, again, let's imagine that our data universe is, you know, consists of these sort of D binary attributes. For this, it's actually sort of important that your data universe has sort of finite dimensionality. Uh -huh. And, and uh, yeah, we're, we're going to take advantage of that. So, so just in describing how this is going to work, there's one important fact that I want you to remember. That is, no matter what sequence of case statistical queries the analyst ended up asking, like ex post, ex post there will always have been some data set that I could have constructed of size only log k over tau squared that actually encodes all of the answers uh, with empirical error only tau with respect to my real data set. And that's sort of for a simple reason, like ex post after the k questions have been asked, well, you know, now I can think about just taking a fresh sample of data from the distribution. And with respect to this new sample, uh, the questions are now non-adaptive. So I just apply a Hufting bound on a Bonferroni correction. And to get error tau across all of those uh, questions, I need this many samples. OK, so I don't know what this data set looks like, but I know that ex post there will have been a pretty small data set that encoded the answers to all of these queries. Importantly, since there's only two to the d like data elements here, if I wanted to enumerate all such small data sets, well, I could in principle do that. There's only two to the d, the number of universe elements, times log k over tau squared, the number of distinct ones I might need, small data sets. Okay. <laughs> So now here's the method for coming up with guesses. Initially, I'm going to just write down the set of all small data sets. Okay. There's a lot of them, but I can, in principle, write them down if I use enough twiddles. So now, OK, a query comes in. What's, what's my guess? Well, I'm going to do a pretty natural thing. 
my guess is going to be computed as follows. I'll just evaluate the query on all of the data sets in my, in, in my big collection of, sm of small data sets C. That'll give me a bunch of different numbers. And my guess as to what the answer is going to be for your query is the median of those numbers. Okay. Then that was how I came up with a guess. I'll just submit the query on the guess to my estimator. And if the guess was correct, you know, correct up to error tau, that's great. I'll, I, I won't make any change at all to my set of consistent small data sets. But if the guess was wrong, right, meaning I actually had to get some numeric valued answer that had error more than tau with respect to my guess, then I will just sort of update my set of uh, consistent data sets to be consistent with this new answer, meaning I will remove all of the data sets in this set that with respect to my guess had error less than tau, or, or rather had error greater than tau. Um, or sorry, no, I'll remove all the ones that had error less than tau because I learned that the real answer was further away than tau from my guess. And so I know that like there's this one small data set that is going to ultimately encode all of the answers correctly, but it's not one of the ones I removed. Okay. Okay. Well, now we can just think about how often my guesses will be wrong. We know that initially my set was, was pretty big, but not that big. It was 2 to the d times log k over tau squared. And uh, along the way, I'm removing you know, data sets that turned out to be inconsistent with my guesses. But since I took the set of all small data sets to begin with, and I know that ex post one of them will be consistent, I know that I'm never going to throw away everything. No matter how long I run this thing for, there'll always be at least one data set in my consistent set. And here's the important thing. Because we were guessing the median, every time the median was wrong by more than tau, we cut the size of our consistent set in half. Because right, if the median was wrong by more than tau, then half of them had to be wrong by more than tau. OK, so we started with sort of a set of size 2 to the d log k. It never goes below size 1. And every time we make a mistaken guess, it gets cut in half. So like definitely, no matter what happens, the number of times our guess is mistaken is bounded by the log of this, so just d log k over tau squared. OK, we can apply our theorem. Our total error is, well, the, the empirical error, tau, plus what we get uh, by applying a Bonferroni correction to um, you know, exponential in this many hypotheses. There's this parameter tau, which again, we get to set. So we just set it to minimize this quantity. And you get that you get uh, sort of a bound that is sort of uh, making, uh, getting error that scales, well, now only with log k again, not polynomially with k. We now have a function of the, uh, of the dimension here, which we didn't have before. And the, the exponent's not the right one. It's not 1 half. It's 1 fourth. But we can answer arbitrary sequences of statistical queries. And you know, if you think about the number of questions we can answer before uh, we start getting trivial confidence intervals, it's again something that's exponential in n rather than only linear in n. So almost done. I'm going to just sort of transition to, to what Adam's going to talk about. Let's just sort of think about some takeaways of, of, of what we've learned here. Um, so by thinking just about the simple compressibility kind of argument, we can already get error that's scaling only polylogarithmically with k rather than polynomially with k, which was sort of what we had to do if we didn't think hard about how to design these statistical estimators. Um, but our bounds are, you know, could be better. Um, you know, like the bounds we were getting didn't have the right exponent. Um, and cer certainly for this last estimator I showed you, it wasn't computationally efficient. I had to like, enumerate some vast number of data sets. Um, and maybe the sort of moral takeaway was that, or, or one, one sort of takeaway is that like, um, so long as the number of questions asked is sort of bigger than the effective dimension of the data, or like the actual dimension of the data, um, we can come up with ways to start guessing the answers really well, which is what gives us these compressibility arguments. But given what I've told you so far, we don't have any sort of theorems that provably um, improve over like the naive estimator when the number of, or when the size of the data set is actually smaller than the dimension. 
Okay. So, so these are all sort of problems, and we don't yet know how to mitigate all of them, but we know how to mitigate some of them. And this is going to be sort of, uh, Adam's going to show us how to get part of the way there. Okay, so to do that, we're going to have to move beyond description length. Okay, so to sort of more information theoretic kinds of arguments. Um, but we want that whatever thing we're, we're sort of measuring should have some of the nice properties that we got to use with our description length arguments. Like in particular, it should be something that's robust to post-processing because you know, the data analyst is going to get to interpret and think about the answers our estimator gives in arbitrary ways. And, it, and, and because it's this inherently sequential thing, it should be something that composes well. Okay. So if you haven't heard of it, there's, there's this nice thing uh, that, that uh, Cynthia and, and Frank McSherry and Kobe Nissim and Adam came up with a while ago called differential privacy. And this is a stability constraint on an algorithm. Okay, so it's a constraint on a randomized algorithm that takes as input data sets, which are just collections of records, flips some coins, and then has some output distribution. And differential privacy is a stability constraint. It says if I change the input by a little bit by changing one record arbitrarily, but only one record, the output distribution shouldn't change by too much. Okay, a little more formally, uh, if I've got some algorithm mapping data sets to some arbitrary output space, we can say that it's alpha beta differentially private if for all pairs of data sets that are neighboring, that differ in just one element, and for all outcomes, outcome events E, when I look at the probability of that outcome when I run the algorithm on S and when I run the algorithm on the neighboring data set S prime, those probabilities should be close. Close in a multiplicative sense by an E to the alpha factor, and in an additive sense by a, this additive term beta. Okay. A crucial property of this is that there's no metric on the outcome space. It's not a Lipschitz condition with respect to some metric on the outcome space. It's a stability condition on the distribution on outputs. So we don't care what the output space is, and this is going to be what makes it robust to post-processing. Okay. So some useful facts you know, robustness to post-processing. If you show me an algorithm that's alpha, beta, differentially private, then I can take some arbitrary function that just looks at the output of this algorithm and maps it to something else. And when I compose these two things, I sort of run your algorithm and then I map its output to something else in an arbitrary way, this sort of composition is also differentially private with the same parameters. The important thing is we don't need to understand anything about this function f. So it could be a precisely specified algorithm, or it could be a human data analyst. Okay, this is the property that we need in order to be able to like universally quantify overall data analysts. Okay, uh, another nice property is that it, you know, if you if you have a few differentially private computations and you run them sequentially, even if you choose the identity of these computations adaptively, the privacy guarantee degrades in a well-behaved way. Okay. So if I have an arbitrary data analyst, and then in a sequence of k rounds, I let the data analyst choose some arbitrary computation. It's got to be a differentially private computation with parameter alpha. In some arbitrary way, as a function of the outputs of the previous computations, okay, and then output the entire transcript, this whole transcript, this was a, sometimes called the Advanced Composition Theorem by Cynthia and, and Guy Rothblum and Salil Vadan, says that you know, with the universal quantifiers we want, you know, no matter who the data analyst is, um, the composition of these things will also be differentially private, where the differential privacy parameter degrades only with the square root of the number of rounds of competition. Okay, the fact that it's degrading only with the square root and not linearly is going to be the source of some of the improvements that Adam's going to be able to tell us about. Okay. So these are two important properties because they mean that um, we can think of differential privacy as a language for stable algorithm design. Right? We, can, we don't have to prove differential privacy from scratch for every new complicated algorithm, which if we designed complicated algorithms would be really hard. Um, instead, we can sort of prove differential privacy for simple you know, modules and then glue them together in arbitrary ways to design complicated algorithms, which will be useful if we want to get good statistical estimators, and then just sort of modularly reason about the privacy properties by thinking about post-processing and composition. Okay. 
the simplest primitives, by the way, are extremely simple. OK, so suppose I have a statistical query, and I want to answer it uh, such that it's you know, pretty accurate with respect to the sample. Well, it turns out one thing I can do is just compute the answer to that query, and then perturb it with Gaussian noise. And the noise doesn't have to be very big. Right, for a statistical query, which is just asking what is the average value of some predicate over a data set of size n, um, sort of the standard deviation of the noise only has to scale with 1 over n times the privacy parameter that I want. OK, so this will be sort of a small perturbation if n is big. And like therefore, the, if I measure my error with respect to the empirical answer, it's going to be pretty small because I've just got the empirical answer plus some noise. So if the magnitude of the noise is small, my empirical error is small. And the reason we care about small empirical error is because we're going to have a very similar transfer theorem to the sort I showed you about with description length bounds, but for differential privacy. OK, so I'll leave you with this. Then we'll have a break. And then Adam will tell us more about this. But we've got the following theorem. So suppose we've got a statistical estimator that, again, satisfies two properties. The first is that the algorithm is differentially private. Okay. This, is what's just, this is what's replacing the sort of compressibility hypothesis for our easy theorem. And the second is that the algorithm is simultaneously empirically accurate. Okay, the answers it gives to statistical queries are with high probability uh, accurate in sample, meaning like the numeric valued answers it gets are close to the um, empirical answers to those questions on the actual data set you've got. The transfer theorem says if you can design an estimator that has these two properties simultaneously, then you're automatically accurate out of sample. Okay. So it's reducing this problem, of, again, just as the sort of description length theorem did. It's reducing this problem to a problem of algorithm design, making no reference to the sort of distribution we want to be accurate with respect to, but just with respect to sort of in-sample things. Okay. And with that, uh, we've got a break. And here are the, the papers I talked about. And um, if you want to read about some of this stuff in a little more detail, Adam and I taught a course this last year. Uh, and we've got lecture notes on this easy to remember website. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, we have a, a coffee break. Yeah, sorry, a bit late. No, that's perfect. No, I think it's probably